This story is about a man who mistook his wife for a hat, and it's an utterly fascinating peek into the windows of the mind. This story comes from a book by British neurologist Oliver Sacks. In it, he introduces a man named Dr. P, who was referred to him by an optometrist. As Dr. P entered, Oliver Sacks described him as a man of great cultivation who talked well and fluently with imagination and humor. This man, in any ordinary sense, seemed to not need the expertise of a neurologist. As Sachs began talking to his seemingly perfectly normal Dr. P, something pulled at the edges of his anxiety. Something was wrong. Dr. P's eyes seemed to dart from each feature of his face, nose, chin, a distinctive mole. He looked for facial cues and didn't seem to take Sachs's face in as a whole like what was normal. He looked at a face like a math equation. If your nose plus chin plus distinctive freckle equal your face, most individuals wouldn't need to do the arithmetic in their minds before coming to the sum. The distinction would be made in the opposite direction. For example, that's Jane. She has a distinctive freckle on her face. Not, there's a distinctive freckle on her face. That must be Jane. But this was a formality maybe even a figment of Sachs's imagination. As was proper, the neurological exam continued. Reflexes were checked, eyes were dotted, and T's were crossed. It was then that the first strange occurrence of many happened. During the exam, Dr. P had been prompted to take off his shoe. With the conclusion of the exam, Sachs left the room briefly, expecting Dr. P to return the shoe to its normal place on his foot. On Sachs's return, this had not happened. Can I help? Sachs asked. Help what? Help whom? Dr. P replied. Help you put on your shoe. Dr. P seemed baffled. Your shoe, Sachs repeated. Perhaps you'd put it on. Dr. P looked downward, though not at his shoe but at his foot, saying, That is my shoe, yes? This was perplexing to Sachs, to say the least. Sachs replied, No, it's not. That is your foot. There is your shoe. Aha, Dr. P said. I thought that was my foot. How could Dr. P not recognize his foot to be his foot? Or better yet, fail to recognize that a shoe not connected to his body is not his foot. Sachs thought Dr. P to have visual agnosia. Agnosia being of ancient Greek origin translating to ignorance or absence of knowledge. This was thought to be a deficit in perception of visual stimuli. Visual agnosia is effectively the inability to recognize objects by sight alone explaining why Dr. P couldn't recognize a shoe as a shoe or his wife's head to not be his hat. Let's assume Dr. P is looking at an apple. The sensation enters his eye, flows to his optic nerve, then visual cortex. Since he was originally sent to Sachs from an optometrist who deemed his vision as not to be the issue, the problem must be further down the route of sensation. It was assumed by Sachs that Dr. P's brain could uptake the visual information but failed to transfer it into meaningful data, which is the job of the visual cortex. Oliver Sachs was limited by the information of his time. The best diagnosis he could give Dr. P was the having of a massive tumor or degenerative process in the visual parts of his brain, leading to a situation in which the visualization of faces and scenes was profoundly impaired, almost absent. There's been extensive research invested into the phenomenon of visual agnosia. With the development of MRI technology, we've been able to look at the possible deficits in the brain. A study done by Dav and Burton in 2019 researched a patient that developed a deficit in the recognition of people over the span of two days. After an MRI, it was discovered that she had changes consistent with multifocal bihemispheric high-grade glioma, a cancer of the brain that begins in glial cells. This patient had developed a condition known as face blindness, or prosopagnosia, along with a temporo-occipital tumor, somewhat identical to the diagnosis of Dr. P. After thorough research through autopsy and MRI studies like these, it was found that 
Prosopagnosia patients show lesions in what is known as the fusiform face area, or FFA. And the FFA is said to be a specialized area of the brain devoted solely to the recognition of faces. And it's hard to overstate its importance in socialization and community in humans and even primates. The ability to remember a face is a precious one, making the fusiform face area as priceless as the brain itself. But researchers are still in conflict about whether it specializes in deciphering faces or certain objects in a group. We do know damage to the FFA leads to prosopagnosia, like in the study before, but support is still split among experts between a face specificity model, an individuation hypothesis, and an expert individuation hypothesis of the fusiform face area. The face specificity model says that yes, the FFA is specialized for face processing. In opposition, the individuation hypothesis says the FFA may be specialized for individuating visually similar items within a category. The third hypothesis is the expert individuation hypothesis, where the individuation of the fusiform face area is in categories where the individual has expertise. Rhodes, Byatt, Mishi, and Puse in 2004 provided support for the face specificity model by comparing the fusiform face area activation to faces and a class of butterflies and moths called Lepidoptera. It was found that the FFA was activated more for faces than Lepidoptera and that FFA activation for Lepidoptera was more akin to common objects. Another study done by Isabel Gother gave support to the expert individuation hypothesis by testing bird experts and car experts with tasks of each while observed under an fMRI machine. Results suggest that level of categorization and expertise rather than superficial properties of objects determine the specialization of the FFA. Unfortunately, what we do know for sure is prosopagnosia is a largely irreversible deficit. And we also know that it's a more complex one than originally assumed. There's a mystifying inconsistency in propagnosia research. I mean, why could Dr. P not recognize faces but perform well on other visual perception tests? Research was done by a team of scientists in the other deficiencies beyond perception related to prosopagnosia. 30 individuals with developmental prosopagnosia were tested against a control group in a facial recollection test. The experimental group was found to have a statistically significant deficit in facial recollection along with the all already known prosopagnosia deficit of perception. Now, we're not completely sure about the specialization of the fusiform face area or how complicated prosopagnosia is. It could be just a deficit to visual perception, but it could also go deeper, having effect on facial recollection. What we do know is that there's many individuals with similar deficiencies to Dr. P. About 2.5% of the population struggles with facial blindness, and its severity ranges from mild to severe. In the years since all of Sachs published this story, a comprehensive list of coping strategies have been developed in response to prosopagnosia as a deficit. We know that prosopagnosia is quite resistant to improvement, but that's not to say strategies can't be created to help. Some of the coping strategies is relying on significant others to identify people for you. Another is developing memorable links between a person's qualities and characters. Another interesting strategy is to use distinguishing facial cues to identify, like a mole or a protruding chin. This is to reverse that math equation introduced earlier, adding up facial features to decipher who the individual is. There's a distinctive mole that must be Jane. An interesting study done by Bates, Adams, and Bennett's in 2020 showed an improvement in children's facial recognition ability when playing a modified version of the game Guess Who. This shows promise with early intervention and proper training in the identification of faces. There's no telling what the future of facial blindness looks like. In recent years, it seems more coping measures have been developed as opposed to avoidance or healing ones. It's difficult to show people how to avoid damage to their fusiform face area, since that really doesn't even mean anything besides avoid being hit in the head and developing tumors. But in all cases, dealing with the brain, those are two very strong pieces of advice. But more research is being done into brain implants, like Neuralink, revealing a new frontier for human-computer integration. 
In a study done in 2002 by Saruya, it was proven that neurons convey intent sufficiently enough to control artificial devices by having a monkey move a cursor on a computer to a new position. This research is in hopes to eventually help paralyzed individuals move again, but with more advancements, this could have an impact inside the brain itself. Who's to say something as simple as an AI attached to glasses reading faces for an individual can't be developed, or an implant that collects and deciphers visual stimuli all together for a person with a fusiform deficiency can't be implanted. It's interesting to note that Oliver Sacks himself realized he had prosopagnosia later in his life. He had always been bad with faces, but never attributed it to a measurable deficiency in his brain. It wasn't until he went to visit his brother who had similar issues that he realized his deficiency may be genetic. It's likely that many people struggling with facial blindness don't even realize they have it at all. I'm Will, and thank you for listening.